If I'm delusional like that, it might actually come true. So, you know, they say if you want it, dream it. So it is freezing. Thank you for bearing the cold and bearing the weather to, to be here this morning. And with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for those in attendance this morning. We do thank you for the, the, the safety of the, the roads that people could come this morning. May we just have a blessing as we open the word of God together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first song is number 91, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, page number 91. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. How I love to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more Yes, I've learned to trust in Jesus And from sin and self to cease Now from Jesus simply taking Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he is with me. He'll be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Well, that's a lively, lively way to get our day started. Our unison reading today comes from Exodus chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. I'm going to invite Miss Christy at Yannick to the pulpit to lead us in this reading as the rest of us stand. If you're comfortable and able to do so, stand as we uh, read this unison reading from the book of Exodus. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Amen. And may the Lord add his 
Blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. When we left off last week, the Egyptians are still slave masters over the downtrodden, very much abused Israelites. God sends Moses along with his brother Aaron to meet with the Pharaoh, insisting that he allow the Hebrew people to go free for a three-day journey so they may go into the wilderness and worship the one and true God. The Pharaoh refuses. As a quick review from last week, because of this, number one, the Lord through Moses and Aaron makes all the waters in Egypt turn to blood. This first plague lasts seven days, but the hard-hearted Pharaoh does not change his mind. Then the Lord through Moses and Aaron plagued the Egyptians with an army of frogs. And I looked that one up. You know how a bunch of fish are called a school and a bunch of wolves are called a pack? Well, a bunch of frogs are called an army. See, you can learn something new in church. Anyhow, the Pharaoh hates this infestation of frogs, so he agrees to allow the Israelites to go. But when the frogs all croak, thank you, and stop invading Egypt, the Pharaoh changes his mind. Plague number three, the Lord then has Moses tell Aaron to hit the ground with his rod, and everywhere in Egypt, the dust turns into lice. Lice start crawling on all the Egyptian people and their animals, but the Pharaoh's heart remains hard against the Israelites. Plague number four, the Lord then sends a swarm of flies. The Pharaoh agrees to allow the people to go, but when the flies leave, the Pharaoh's stubbornness returns. Plague number five, then the Lord has all the Egyptian livestock just drop dead, but after which the Pharaoh will still not allow the people to go. That brings us to plague number six. After this, boils break out on all the Egyptians' skin. The Pharaoh's heart remains hard, plague number seven. Thunder and fiery hailstones are next. They fall down upon Egypt. The storm destroys much of their crops, their homes, and their animals. The Pharaoh momentarily releases the Jews, but then when the storm stops, he reneges. Number eight, the Lord sends a swarm of locusts. They eat everything that's left behind by the hailstones, and the Pharaoh's heart again turns hard. The ninth plague, the one we left off on last week, God sends in darkness. Uh, he blots out the sun from the Egyptians. The Pharaoh is again momentarily agreeable, but as soon as the light returns, so does his hard-heartedness. That was a quick review from last week. To me, nine plagues are about eight and a half too many. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh's heart is so hard that nine aren't enough, so God plans to send a tenth plague. Just like a showman, the Lord get, saves his grandest for last. Here comes his finale, his encore, his showstopper, and it's a doozy. The Lord promises Moses that after this tenth plague and final plague, the Pharaoh will not only allow the people to go, he will throw them out of Egypt. The proposal of a mere three-day trek into the wilderness to worship and to make sacrifices to God is seemingly now off the bargaining table. From here on in, the Israelites will require their complete and utter freedom never to ever return to Egypt again. But first, the Israelites are instructed to ask their Egyptian neighbors for gold and valuables and silver jewelry. And after living through nine terrible plagues, the Egyptians for the first time are at the mercy of the Israelites. The Egyptians will do anything the Israelites want them to do and give them anything they ask for. After nine horrible plagues, the Lord makes the Egyptians greatly respect the Israelites and they all consider Moses to be a great leader. All the Egyptians see Moses as a great leader except their leader, the Pharaoh. The Lord tells Moses that at midnight on a particular night, the Lord will go through the land of Egypt, slaying the firstborn in every family. Now, for some reason over the years, this story's been altered. It's the Lord who does the slaying. In fact, if you paid attention to the unison reading, the Lord is called the destroyer. You know, we often see, uh, we often think of the Lord as a kindly old man in the sky who wouldn't hurt a fly. No, the Lord is a God of wrath. God is a God of wrath. And he's, we're about to see his wrath here. But over the years, this story has been changed where it's a, the death angel or the angel, of, the, the angel of death goes through the Egypt. Well, no, it's the Lord himself. Anyway, Moses promises that this death that's going to happen will include everyone from the Pharaoh's own force, firstborn child to the firstborn of the lowliest, lowliest woman in, in Egypt. Even the firstborn of all the animals will die. And because of this, there will never, 
there will be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt. Nothing like this has ever happened before, nor has it ever happened since. But the Israelites will not need to cry. They have a way out of this. Things will be so quiet for the Israelites that not even a dog will be heard barking. Then the Egyptians will know that the Lord is good to the Israelites as he punishes the Egyptians. After this tenth plague, the Egyptian leaders will come down and bow before Moses and beg him just to take the Israelites and to leave Egypt. You know, by this time, Moses is pretty angry. It should have never come to this. The Lord has performed many miracles, many plagues up until this point, And the Pharaoh witnesses and was affected by every one of these plagues. But he is still so stubborn that he will not allow the Israelites to leave his country or to recognize their one and true only God. The Lord tells Moses and Aaron to instruct the people that on the tenth day of the month, each family must choose a one-year-old lamb or goat big enough for the whole family to eat. If any family is too small to eat the entire animal, they must share it with their next-door neighbors. Then on the fourteenth day of that month, the lambs or goats are to be killed, and their blood will be captured in a basin, and some of their blood must be brushed on with hyssop uh, uh, on the two door posts and above the door of each house which the animals are to be eaten. That night the animals are to be roasted and eaten together with bitter herbs and thin bread made without yeast. The lamb must not be eaten raw or boiled. The whole animal, including its leg, head and insides must be roasted the animal must be eaten that night any leftovers need to be burned the next day and during all this everyone must be dressed packed and ready to travel the Israelites are about to make their big getaway that same night the Lord will pass through Egypt and slay the firstborn in every family and the firstborn of all the animals the Lord will Look over all the houses, but then he will overlook the houses which have the blood on their door frames. That's a salvation, salvation message which I'll say for another time. The Lord will pass over the families with the blood. That's where we get the, the term Passover. The people hang on Moses and Aaron's every word. They don't want to mess this up. They don't want to get this wrong. I'm sure they're writing it, now we're to, the lamb, okay, what do we do? The 10th, okay, the 14th day, okay, they're taking all this down because one slip up and their firstborns will die as well. The Israelites obey Moses' instructions to the T. So the night comes, the Lord visits Egypt. And just as promised, the firstborn of every Egyptian family is found dead from the son of the Pharaoh to the sons of every lowly prisoner in jail. God truly is no respecter of persons. If we think that our status here on this earth impresses God, we are so fooling ourselves. Also found dead, as I said, the firstborn of every animal that belongs to the, the Egyptians. Well, in the middle of the night, the Pharaoh and his officials and everyone else in Egypt wake up and they start crying bitterly. Their, their, their wailing can be heard from all over. In every Egyptian home, someone is found dead, but the Israelites' firstborns are spared. Still nighttime, the Pharaoh summons for Moses and Aaron and tells them to get their people and to leave the country quickly. The Pharaoh orders them to take their stupid sheep and their blast of goats and all that belongs to them and, and just get out. But the Pharaoh also requests that the God of the Hebrews be merciful to him. So there's a little bit of a silver lining. At least for a moment, this evil Pharaoh recognizes our God. The Egyptians do everything they possibly can to get the Israelites to leave their country as fast as possible. I think they're afraid that if the Israelites don't leave quickly, that their God, Jehovah, will send an 11th plague, killing all the survivors. Now, I just gave you a brief overview of the events surrounding the, the Passover, the 10th plague. Please make it a point to read the story and all the rules attached to the Passover plague in their entirety. The Passover story begins in Exodus 12. Anyway, so the Pharaoh, it seems, the Pharaoh finally lets the children of Israel go. That day he loses thousands and thousands of slaves. Is this really the end? Is the Pharaoh finally over his stubbornness? Has his heart finally softened? Well, no, but we'll get back to the Pharaoh in a few minutes. 
The Israelites seemingly have two options as they escape Egypt and travel toward the promised land. First, they can go through the Philistine territory, but the Lord knows even though he will protect them, once the Israelites see the mighty Philistine armies, they will turn tail and run straight back to Egypt for safety. And then we'll have to begin all this all, all over again. Well, the Lord doesn't want that. He didn't deliver 10 plagues so that they could return back to where they came. So the second option, really the only option, is for them, for the Lord to take the Israelites another way toward the Red Sea. All the Israelites have packed their belongings, their clothes, their food, their essentials, the jewelry they borrowed from their Egyptian masters. But the Bible tells us that Moses takes with him something unusual. He takes with him the bones of Joseph. You know the story. We just taught it maybe a month ago, many years prior. Also a, he uh, also a Hebrew. Uh, this Joseph became the second most powerful man in Egypt so that God could, through him, save his people from a great seven-year famine. Joseph was buried in Egypt. Moses sees a chance to rectify this. Moses plans to bury the bones of Joseph in the promised land. In a day before GPS and even road maps, God steers the group of thousands upon thousands of Israelites by having them follow a pillar of cloud during the daytime and a pillar of flame at nighttime. I don't exactly know what that means, whether this is in the sky or ahead of them, or, or maybe how big it was, how small it was, I don't know. I just know this moving pillar of cloud and this moving pillar of flame could be seen by all, assuring that if following, assure, assuring those following these pillars will not get lost. So let's get back to the Pharaoh. Never one to learn his lesson, never one to count his losses, never one to take his lumps or to quit while he's behind. Soon after the Israelites are set free, the Pharaoh has second thoughts about losing his thousands of servants. The Bible estimates the Israelite numbers as to be about uh, 600,000. That's a big exodus from your country. Anyway, I was going to say something about that. <laughs> Could you imagine, could you imagine if 600,000 people just showed up at your border? I'm just saying, that would just be, I can't imagine. <laughs> the Pharaoh commands that his chariot be made ready and brought to him. He then has his captains make ready their chariots to follow after him. There are 600 chariots involved, and we're not told how many horsemen, how, how many people are on horseback traveling with them. All the soldiers, of course, are armed with weapons. The Israelites are not. The Egyptian army pursues after the Israelites, who are mainly traveling on, on foot. It doesn't take the Pharaoh's army too awfully long to catch up to these Israelites, who have their children and their elderly slowing them down. And there the Israelites are, stuck between a rock and a hard place, stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea, literally. They have the Red Sea in front of them and the mighty Egyptian army behind them, pursuing after them. If they go forward, they will drown. If they go back, they'll be killed. They are a trap. They're, they're like rats in a trap, and there is no apparent ex ex escape. Recognizing their predicament, the people speak very harshly and very sarcastically to Moses. I'll give you the modern-day translation of this. They, they said, was there no, Moses, I'm just curious, was there no available place to bury our dead bodies in Egypt that you needed to bring us out to this God-forsaken wilderness so that we could die and be buried here instead? That's, that's, that's so delicious it can't be fat-free. I love that, that sarcasm. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why couldn't you have minded your own business and left us alone? The people forget that they have something on their side more powerful than Moses. Why? The people will have someone on their side even more powerful than the mighty Egyptian army. And Moses reminds them, fear ye not, stand still. In other words, hush. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them never again no more. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. In other words, just shut up and let the Lord work here. So what happens next? Well, you have to come back next week, but you've seen the movie. <laughs> you know what happens next, but come back next week and hear it from my mouth. Let's turn to page number 495. It is well with my soul. 
page number 495. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, know oh, the joy of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The more clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Thank you for singing out. Our responsive reading comes from two passages in the book of Psalms, Psalms, the 22nd Psalms and the 71st Psalms. Please stand if you're able and comfortable as I invite uh, Brother Tom Anderson to the pulpit to lead us in these, this reading from Psalms, the uh, Psalms, uh, 22nd Psalms and the 71st Psalms. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. For thou art my hope. O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of these. Amen. You may be seated. Two days ago, thousands of pro-life advocates braved the winter weather to march for the rights of unborn children at our nation's capital. I'm assuming many of you are hearing this probably for the first time because for whatever reason, this huge event barely made a blip on the national news media's radar. This morning, I would like to add my two cents regarding this, the pro-life cause. But before I do, let me say this. If there's anyone here who has had or has had a loved one terminate a pregnancy, neither you nor they will get a scolding from me this morning. That is not the purpose of my sermon. I have no idea what you were going through at the time of this decision was made. Perhaps you had no positive support from your family or friends or from the baby's father. Perhaps you were not in control of the situation at all. Maybe it was not your decision to make. Perhaps you, your back was against the wall and you felt nothing but fear. To this I say to you, God bless you. Who am I to judge you? Who am I to judge anyone? If I was faced with such a hard decision, who knows what I would do? You have nothing but today but my compassion. Some might think that I have no business talking about this subject at all. 
Because we currently live in a world where only those directly involved by a difficulty are permitted to, ex to express their opinions on that difficulty. Only gay people are allowed to speak upon, on gay issues. Only African Americans are permitted to speak about race. And I have to admit there is some merit in this thinking. But you're in luck this morning. I may freely speak on this pro-life issue. You see, once upon a time, I was a fetus. And being a former fetus, I am permitted to express my opinion. And if that's not enough for you, I was a fetus in danger. My mother, who was 42 years of age when she gave birth to me, uh, this was a time when, when doing so was much more risky than it is today. There have been many medical prenatal advancements made in the last 60 years. Although abortion was not legal back in the 1960s, it was certainly available and an option, but enough about me and an, enough about that. In the past, I have been asked, why can't Christians just move past this whole abortion thing? It should be settled by now. Why is the debate of pro-life versus pro-choice so important to Christians? Why is this topic so vital to Christians when we, that we'll even stoop to vote for candidates whom we would otherwise dismiss simply because those candidates timidly claim to be pro-life. Well, this is an election year. And by the way, I hate that this has become a political issue. I hate that. Within our, all the platforms and speeches and debates, candidates will st still prefer not to talk about abortion, and with good reason. It is a topic in which there seemingly is no middle ground. It is a subject so polarizing that candidates are guaranteed to lose big numbers of votes by simply choosing one side or the other. And because of this, candidates seemingly try to avoid this topic unless they are pressed to answer the question, unless they are asked directly to give their stance. And when the simple question is asked, are you pro-life or pro-choice, the candidate usually looks like a deer in the headlights, carefully selecting the right words and sidestepping the wrong words as if they were landmines. Candidates will babble dozens of words when just a few will suffice before giving his or her answer. But the election aside, the question remains, why is the subject of abortion still a hot button issue with most Christians? Well, it's, a still, a, it's still a hot button issue because nothing has changed. Oh, public opinion on this issue may have shifted. The laws of our land may have been adjusted. But the core of this issue has not changed. As I preached last week, and if you missed that sermon, you might want to catch it on Facebook or YouTube today. But as I preached last week, life is still a vapor. Nothing's changed from the time that James wrote that, those words. Life is but a vapor. Life is still precious. And there is no greater sin and no greater sacrifice than the, the deliberately shedding of innocent blood. And second only to Christ's blood, the, the blood of an unborn baby is the most innocent blood that we can have on this earth. It is true that all babies are born sinners and they're all born into this sinful world, but an unborn baby cannot commit sins themselves. They are innocent. Do you remember in the Gospel of John chapter 9 when the disciples come across a blind man? And they ask Jesus, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And every time I read this, I can feel Jesus giving his disciples a, an exhausted eye roll. Like, that's stupid. <laughs> I don't know if Jesus gave eye rolls, but I would like to think he did. How possibly could this man have sinned before he was born? What sin could a baby possibly commit in the womb to deserve blindness as his punishment? I can imagine Jesus just like, oh, you guys, what a stupid question. And I know our teachers told us there's no such thing as a stupid question. But I'm sorry, that's a stupid question. Anyway, in short, there are no opportunities to commit sins in the womb. Therefore, when an unborn life is purposely stopped, this action is as close to shedding of the innocent blood as the death of Jesus Christ himself. That is why Bible-believing Christians, God-fearing Christians, will never accept the practice of aborting viable, living, unborn, innocent babies. It's just so hard for us. And true, it takes a man and a woman to make a baby, but a man and a woman cannot give that child life. Only God can make life. And since that life is not ours to give, it's not ours to take away either. 
Oh, innocent life is precious no matter who the parents happen to be. In Job 31, 15, Job explains that there's no difference between him being in the womb and, 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 the, and the servant, one of his servants' lives. There's no difference between the value of his life and the value of one of his servants' lives. He says, didst not he that made me in the womb make him? In other words, the same God that made me, who Job, who was an influential, successful, rich man, made the servant as well, and did not one fashion us in the womb? The same God that makes one makes the others. The life of a lowly unborn servant is just as valuable as the life of a once wealthy and influential Job. God has given that which is in the womb a purpose. In the 49th chapter of the book Isaiah, uh, Isaiah the prophet says, The Lord hath called me from the womb. And from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And now saith the Lord that for me from the womb to be his servant. Isaiah claims that while he was in the womb, God says, you're going to be my prophet. You're going to be my man. You're going to be my servant. And I'm a firm believer in God's will and his destiny way before we're even born. I believe that no life begins as insignificant and all life has initial value. But I also believe God gives us free will to live our lives. And it is how we choose to live our precious God-given lives, which may increase or decrease our value to others. But I believe that at conception, every life is ordained and every life has a purpose handpicked by the Creator Himself. In eternity past, God knew and planned that one day a baby boy named David Greer would be born. He predetermined what hair color I would have. He even knew that I would have blue eyes. He also planned that one day I would be, among other things, the pastor of the Norvelt Union Church. In fact, God may still have future plans for me, which I haven't yet even dreamed. Now, David Greer is no different than anyone else here. God knows us all, loves us all, and has plans for us all since before the creation of this entire world. Every person is predestined by God before he or she is born. When we choose to interrupt God's plan, and terminate a child who he has predestined to live, it is actually we who suffer. We also interrupt the child's free will to live according to God's plan and his will. There is a, 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 a great price tag in this act. We often talk about the victims of abortion. Of course, the primary victim is the unborn child whose life is cut entirely too short by someone else's choice. Then we consider the mothers of these children who may have made their decisions rashly and maybe uneducatedly and, and they often regret then, uh, the, the, this decision from which they never completely fully recover. But I would like to bring to your attention some victims who get very little attention and those victims being us, society. Do you ever wonder why our society is in such a mess? Why do we face so many problems and the problems seem to get worse with each passing generation? I'm sure there are dozens of answers to these questions, but for the next few moments, I want you to consider, just consider that maybe, just maybe our society is so full of problems because those with the solutions to those problems were terminated. Is it really so far-fetched to believe that these children we are aborting by the hour were actually meant to grow up and contribute greatly to our society? Maybe, I know, it's far-fetched, but maybe, just maybe, the next child who will be aborted is the very one God preordained to grow up and discover the cure for cancer. Perhaps the next baby aborted is the very in individual who, will, uh, who was supposed to one day act and end an act of terrorism. It is short-sighted, to say the least, that a society would allow such a valuable commodity, such as innocent life, to be destroyed. I also believe there exists a devil. I believe that there is an evil presence in this world. I believe that, that Satan is very active in 2024. And I ask myself, well, what's the devil's game? What does he have to gain in all this? Why do I feel that he has such, he, he such an influence and presence in the making of these decisions? How does Satan benefit from a society that terminates its most precious gifts? I believe that every time a child's life is interrupted, there is a void in our society and the devil wins. Every time a child is terminated, our society suffers and the devil grins. The practice of abortion has weakened our society and it's robbed us of hope. 
Abortion has helped us to turn this country away from God and leave us faithless and defeated exactly how the devil wants us. Unfortunately, we cannot seem to vote this issue away. Fortunately, there is a power even greater than our elected officials. And with his help, I believe there is hope. There is always hope with, with God on your side. I want to give us a challenge to each one of us. I know they're not very popular topics, but we need to talk more about abstinence and celibacy and fidelity and monogamy and even adoption. We need to spread the word that life is precious in the sight of God. Red and yellow, black and white, we are all precious in his sight. And to those who have already fallen victim to unplanned pregnancies and or abortions, let's share with them that God is their rock and his, their refuge and he loves them and he forgives us all of our, of our bad choices and our, and our trespasses and our sins. He will help us rebuild our lives. He will help us to help them. He will help us to help them pick them up and pick up the pieces so we can all forge on. Life is precious. You know, I wish all pregnancies were met with excitement. I know that's not the case. But I know, I know there's some that are, that are met, some pregnancies are met as if somebody had just handed these women a bunch of lemons and now they're forced to make lemonade. They're forced to make the best of a bad situation. I wish that weren't always the case. But you see, children are not lemons. And life is not a booby prize. Life is the brass ring. I'm told that three babies are aborted every minute in America. Even some pro-choice advocates admit that is far too many. But that being said, James tells us that our sinful lives are as precious as vapors. Well, then how much more precious is that of an unborn innocent life who has never had a chance to sin? God is our mighty rock. God is the author of life. And God has a plan for that life. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for these people's patience to let me mutter and stammer and stutter through this sermon, through this difficult passage, uh, these difficult, this difficult uh, issue that doesn't seem to get any easier as the years go by. But Lord, whatever we believe, whatever we hold to, may we do so with you in mind. That the fact that you are in charge of us all, that you, you value life. And Lord, may we today give our lives to you and over to you. If there's someone here today who's not received your son as their savior, may they make that calling and election sure in their hearts. May we all be following the, uh, you and, and have the savior, your son, as, as, our, uh, as our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand if you are able. And we are going to sing one verse of Lead Me to Calvary. I love this song. Number 407, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Hey, have a great week. Brother Mike, close us with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather in your house, Lord, to hear your word and sing praises unto you. Lord, we just ask your blessing upon all on, our, on all on our prayer list. Be with them and guide everybody involved in their care. Just let them feel your presence in their lives, whether spoken aloud or held within our hearts. Lord, we just ask that you be with each and every one of us as we head out into the world. Keep us safe and help us to do your will. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. Stay warm. We'll see you next time.